Hello, I'm Betsy Fuller, and many of you already know me. For those who don't, I work on the Bloomberg Philanthropies Public Health Team. Today, I'm really excited to welcome you to the first of a seven part seminar series called Gender Foundations and Health Data. The Bloomberg Public the Bloomberg Philanthropies Public Health Team have made a commitment to prioritize equity in our programming and the Data for Health initiative is no exception. Establishing the Gender Equity Unit at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health demonstrates this commitment and will provide tools and tailored guidance to address gender inequity in health data across the initiative's many partner countries. These seminars are designed for all people who work in global health data collection, analysis, and use. The goal of the series is to bring us all to a consistent understanding of the value and definitions around seeing health data through a gender lens. This will help us be successful in integrating gender awareness across the initiative and so that we are all better equipped to apply an equity lens more broadly to public health. This series will have something for everyone, highlighting global gender experts, as well as real world examples from the data for health work in CRVS, NCD risk factor surveillance and data impact. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Michelle Kaufman, a associate professor in the Department of Health, Behavior and Society at the Bloomberg School and the gender equity lead. Thank you, Betsy. And I'll apologize in advance for uh, the sirens in my urban location here. Um, I'm thrilled to see so many people here today for our inaugural Gender Foundations and Health Data series. Thank you so much for participating. This work is very meaningful to me as a cisgender woman, a mother to a small child, a social psychologist and public health researcher, and as someone who's worked with communities of women and non-binary people around the world. My own research has focused on how social factors such as gender, sexuality, race, and class contribute to disparities in global health outcomes. Our newly formed Data for Health Gender Equity Unit at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health has a tall order. We are embarking on activities to demonstrate the importance of, barriers to, and strategies for advancing gender equity in global public health through data. Over the next 18 months, we plan to become a knowledge center and resource hub for gender equity and health data for the data for health community and wider global health community. This seminar series is at the front end of our work. We hope you will take full advantage of all the resources the Gender Equity Unit will offer. I know some of you on this call already have some level of expertise in gender and equity issues, and we look forward to learning from you as well throughout the series. By means of introduction to our seminar today, I wanna to read a passage from the book, Invisible Women, Data Bias in a World Designed for Men by Caroline Criado Perez. Women are leading the way when it comes to closing the gender data gap. An analysis of 1.5 million papers published between 2008 and 2015 found that the likelihood of a study involving gender and sex analysis increases with the proportion of women among its authors. The effect is particularly pronounced if a woman serves as a leader of the author group. This concern for women's health extends to the political sphere. It was two women, Melinda Gates and Hillary Clinton, who spearheaded the UN-backed organization Data2x that is aimed specifically at closing the global gender data gap. It was a woman, Hillary Clinton, who insisted on going to Beijing in 1995 to make the now famous declaration that human rights are women's rights and women's rights are human rights. Now it is my distinct pleasure on the 10th anniversary year of the founding of Data2x to introduce Emily Curry Pryor, Executive Director, and Neeraja Penumacha, Senior Program Manager of Data2x, 
to give an overview of where we are today in terms of global gendered health data. Michelle, thank you so much for that introduction and an inspiring reading from Caroline's book. I really encourage anyone who hasn't read it to read it. It is, uh, it's, it's stunning, the level of research that she did. And I especially love the passage of, of highlighting, you know, women as leaders in gender data. And, you know, I'll just reflect also that, that it was a woman, it was me, um, who kind of took up that charge from Secretary Clinton to uh, take this from a speech and an idea and build this into an organization. Um, and I was, just to reflect as a mother, I was hugely pregnant at the time. Um, and we are celebrating our 10th anniversary. And actually my son, um, with whom I was pregnant, just turned nine yesterday. <laughs> so um, I have really uh, kind of raised both of my children alongside this organization. And I'm so pleased to see the work of gender data become more, integra more integrated really across all sectors in, including uh, global health. So thanks for this opportunity to you all um, at the Bloomberg School and to Bloomberg Philanthrop Philanthropies for this opportunity. So um, next slide, please, Alyssa. So for those of you who have never heard of Data2x before, I will just say two lines, which is that we are a technical and advocacy organization. We're housed at the United Nations Foundation, and we work to improve the availability, the quality, and the use of gender data worldwide. Next slide, please. So what is gender data? That is why we're here. I know that we have uh, people with a lot of deep expertise um, in, in gender and, and maybe in data as well, but just to kind of level set and make sure that at the beginning of this foundational series, we're all on the same page. I thought we'd go over briefly the definition, um, at least one definition of, of gender data. Next slide, please. So the official UN definition is uh, that gender data is data collected and presented by sex, data that reflects gender issues, can be qualitative and quantitative, and accounts for potential bias. Now, I think there's an important question here, which, and a question that, that we get asked a lot and that we talk about a lot, which is whether or not this definition is inclusive of the diversity of gender identity. And the short answer for what is an important and, and long conversation is that it can be uh, in its acknowledgement of gender issues, stereotypes and factors which may introduce bias, we believe the definition has the ability to be fully inclusive from a gender perspective. However, we recognize too that how the definition is implemented to ensure true visibility of all communities remains a work in progress and one where we believe concerted action is still needed to ensure that everyone is, in, is, is being counted, which at the end of the day is what we care about the most. We also anticipate that the definition itself will likely continue to evolve over time. For our part, you know, we recognize that the need for data systems to evolve and adequately represent individuals of all genders, non-binary identities included. Our particular focus uh, as an organization is on gender data and its policy outcomes for women and girls, but we also continue to assess how the full spectrum of gender identity can be represented in our work. Next slide, please. So we wanted to take a moment to talk about gender data systems, right? And how they interact and how they're producing data to ultimately, you know, result in data that's being used for practical outcomes on people's lives. So this picture that you see here, this illustration, is showing gender data systems at the national level. And so um, at the national level, these systems are bringing together multiple government agencies, civil society, international actors, and the private sector. The nexus of these systems that you see at the center are national statistical offices, which collect and report gender data. Health data is of course a very key component of this, but also health data in particular, um, as compared to other forms of data, can come from multiple sources. So this includes health management information systems, vital statistics systems, as well as household and reproductive health surveys. Ideally, data from multiple sources are integrated and can be layered on top of each other to provide a holistic and comprehensive understanding. 
But in practice, this is not often the case, which limits the full value of the data. Next slide, please. But when we do have, let's imagine a world <laughs> where we have better gender data, we can use it to create better policy. So examples are always helpful. And this one that we'll give here is um, from a, a case in Vietnam. So about 10 years ago, uh, a nationwide survey by Vietnam Statistics Office found that 58% of women reported experiencing physical, sexual, or emotional abuse by their husbands. And 87% of women who had experienced physical or sexual abuse had not sought any form of help. That data started a public conversation about the nature of violence against women and raised awareness around coping strategies and available services, and importantly, informed new government and policy responses addressing violence against women. As a result, women in Vietnam experiencing violence at home are now able to access a range of counseling, health, legal, and shelter services. And a second nationwide survey was recently completed to assess progress. So we take a few lessons from this. First, gender data can be a powerful advocacy tool when it is communicated well. Second, it can be used to both inform and monitor policy commitments. And finally, and, and I would say vitally, policymakers must be engaged in all phases of data collection, analysis, and dissemination to fully understand and use the data. And I wanna just underline that point because I remember um, you know, talking to, to folks who were involved in this at the time. And back when the study started, the perception um, at the government level was that there was not a challenge. There was not a problem with violence against women. Um, and so the results of this data were a big surprise. And there was the political will, you know, and the willingness to do something about it once that data was available. But it was really important to have those policymakers, you know, at the table and engaged in the conversation from the get go. Next slide, please. But, you know, of course, none of this, uh, you know, hoped for policy and programmatic change is really possible without having the data in the first place. So what you see here is, is some results from a 2021 assessment from UN Women who are a close partner of ours. And this shows, of course, that there are gender data gaps across every sustainable development goal. That's probably not a surprise um, to folks that are here. But one thing that you may not have known is that even the data we do have is out of date. You know, most of this has been collected over a decade ago, 10 years ago. Um, so obviously, it's very hard for us to know the current status of things if we're using data that's a decade old. Next slide, please. So um, where are the, the gender data gaps in health? So an obvious first step, of course, is to identify the gaps. And so in 2014, actually right, right at the beginning, um, uh, when, we, when we formed in 2012, and then we worked with a, a whole group of incredible experts um, over about a year, we set out to define what the gender data gaps were. And actually when we were doing this, you know, there was a strong understanding within technical communities of the gaps that were relevant to their specific community. But there was not really an easy place where you had a comprehensive sense of gender data gaps across sectors. And so we really worked to try to put this in one, in one place. So that first came out in 2014, which of course was before the SDGs. And so in 2019, we, we did this again. We did the a mapping of the gender data gaps again and kind of overlaid the SDG perspective as well. Next slide, please. Um, so what you see here is the mapping gender data gaps and specifically the, the health component of this. Uh, there's a lot here, so I won't go through them all, but, but you can see them. Um, and as I said, when we did this in 2014 and 2019, uh, at that point it had been five years. And when we reassessed, most unfortunately, most of the identified gaps persisted. There was prog progress in only two areas, maternal mortality and excess disease burdens. And we identified new gaps in areas like disability and SRHR. So why is this the case? So a lot of health data, uh, I probably don't have to tell anyone here, but a lot of it is from population-based surveys. And due to restricted sampling, much of what we know is about women of reproductive age, 15 to 49. 
And the groups of women and girls missing from the data, so children, younger adolescents, older women, especially those with disabilities, are the most vulnerable. And this lack of data limits our ability to support populations that are already hard to reach and most at risk of being left behind. Next slide, please. So far, I've been speaking about data gaps at a global level, but of course, it's incredibly important to understand gaps at country and regional levels. So in partnership with Open Data Watch, which is a great partner organization of ours, I encourage you to look them up as well. We've also assessed gaps at the regional level in 25 countries across three regions. And so here you'll see a snapshot from that study of health data availability um, by region. So of about 30 indicators, between 53 and 63% of indicators were reported with sex disaggregation, which is higher than in most other domains that we studied. And an additional eight to 24% of indicators were reported without sex disaggregation. It's possible that these data were collected by sex, but just not reported that way. So potentially a simple shift, making sex disaggregation a default for all indicators, for example, could increase availability of gender data by 15% in each country on average. So with that high level, very high level overview of gender data gaps in health, I'm now gonna turn it over to my wonderful colleague, Mirja Penamecha, to dive into some examples of gaps on the next slide. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Um, uh, and yes, as Emily said, I'm going to share a few examples. And I wanted to start with one that you actually might be familiar with on cardiovascular disease and the use of aspirin as a preventative measure. This example is uh, specific to the US, um, but I'm sure there are similar examples in other contexts as well. So from really the 1940s on, um, physicians were starting to see the potential role of aspirin in addressing heart disease, um, but research didn't really begin in earnest until a few decades later. In the 1980s, uh, there was this ambitious long-term study to assess aspirin, the physician's health study. Researchers recruited over 20,000 male physicians in the United States as study participants, and they randomized half to take a daily dose of aspirin to assess the potential effect on a few different outcomes, including myocardial infarction. Um, but before the study was even completed, they had just overwhelming evidence that aspirin was effective and it reduced the risk for MI by 44%, which was published um, in early 1989, I believe. So alongside a few other studies, this really has started to lead to an increase um, in the preventative use of aspirin. But a lot of research up to that point, including this landmark study, just did not study women equally, as Caroline said in, her, um, in the passage that Michelle quoted. So a decade later, you know, in the early 90s, another long-term cohort study began, and this time on women, specifically female health professionals. And about 10 years into that study, the researchers there concluded that aspirin, in fact, did not reduce the risk of MI for women. And so, you know, these blind spots in our research data can lead to failures in guidelines and have long-term consequences for population health. Next slide, please. Um, a second, much more recent example, and one that's, of course, top of mind for all of us, is the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Global Health 5050 has partnered with the International Center for Research on Women and the African Population and Research Health Center to track sex disaggregated data. And so they've been compiling data from the pandemic's earliest days, and they're now up to tracking 205 different countries. And what you see on this slide is a snapshot of the availability of sex disaggregated data across multiple indicators at two different time points. On the top, December 2020, and on the bottom, one year later. Um, and now on some indicators like confirmed cases, deaths, vaccinations, we see a huge improvement over time and with many, and in some cases, even most countries reporting sex disaggregated data as of December. But in other cases, for example, in testing, it's still lagging. And when you dig a bit deeper um, beyond the snapshot, you start to see that countries are reporting the sex disaggregated data either inconsistently or really incompletely across key indicators. 
So as we continue to respond to the pandemic, gender data just absolutely needs to be collected at every point in the system and reported, or else we won't be able to know if access to healthcare is equitable, we won't know where it isn't, and we don't know how to respond to that. Next slide, please. But the gaps are also just not about data collection and production. It's really also about data use. Um, last year, GH5050 also surveyed global health organizations and, on their COVID-19 programming. And so of about the 350 different health program activities um, on COVID-19 from these organizations that were reported, the vast majority were gender blind, meaning that the program did not consider gender norms, roles, or relations while the remaining were either gender sensitive, meaning they did have some consideration of those things, or they were gender specific, meaning that they were targeting a specific gender group. Now, as we know, and as this seminar series, I'm sure so aptly demonstrates, gender influences everything related to health from who gets tested for COVID-19 to the risk of severe disease and death. So even if we had absolutely perfect data about COVID-19 globally, it ultimately would not matter unless we start using it to inform our response. Next slide, please. So how can we start to address these gaps? Going back to the study that Emily noted on mapping gender data gaps, at that time, we came to a few high-level recommendations that are still, um, I think, quite valid to improve health data. The first and um, you know, something that, of course, this group knows quite well is the need for a strong health data system, which means a mix of survey and administrative data like CRBS data, um, which I'll talk a bit more about in a minute. Second, the existing instruments we do have need to be expanded to include the experiences of underrepresented groups, as Emily noted. And then third, newer approaches like cell phone surveys and big data can be useful supplements to traditional methods. And I'll share an example about that as well. Next slide, please. So I want to start with, with CRBS, which is, of course, very familiar to this group. Um, and they provide, you know, this is the system that provides our most basic demographic and health surveys, uh, so health information in countries, not surveys, excuse me. So CRVS data is a key source of health information because it captures births, it captures deaths, and often being registered within those systems can be a necessity to access basic services, including health services in some countries. But women and girls face specific barriers to registration, including poverty, geography, lack of knowledge, and in some cases, discriminatory laws. More than 100 countries still do not have functioning systems that can support the complete registration of these key milestones in life, birth, marriage, divorce, and death. So CRBS is at one time both this critical data source and then at the same time, something that has these significant gaps globally. Next slide, please. Now, ideally and long-term, what we should be doing is investing in robust systems. But in the short term, there are other approaches we could take to reducing gender data gaps. So for example, about a third of deaths worldwide do not include cause of death data, often due to research constraints. So deaths that happen outside of medical settings, for example, can be quite difficult to assess. So one approach that is being taken is verbal autopsies. While these aren't the equivalent of medical autopsies, they can be used to estimate cause of death and other relevant factors like risk factors. So one example is in Nigeria, verbal autop autopsies were actually used to understand more about neonatal and child mortality. And the study um, researchers were able to actually make specific policy recommendations based on the verbal autopsy data on things like improving services around newborn care, nutrition, healthcare services, and more. Next slide, please. Um, and as I mentioned, of course, newer methods can also help fill data gaps. Um, at Data2x, we've done quite a bit of work on the role of big data or digital data um, in addressing these gaps. Because th this data has an increased spatial and temporal resolution, in combination with traditional data, it can really provide unique insights into the lives of women and girls. 
the pandemic and the resulting economic effects have actually played a catalyzing role in the research in this space. Um, and in particular, health is an area that we see as being increasingly well studied by this combination of big data and traditional data. Um, before I share an example, though, I do want to offer a couple of cautions, which is that, one, these data sets are often biased, and we need to be aware of that and correct that in order to ensure that they are accurately representing um, the lives of the population they purport to represent. And second, as we are increasingly leading digital lives, we all need to be thoughtful about protecting individual privacy and keeping data secure while still mining it for the insights that can be helpful um, in, for example, health. Next slide, please. So, you know, overall, though, you know, the potential for big data is really significant. And the example I want to share here comes from our partners at Flowminder, who have done some really incredible work in this space. The example that you see on this slide, um, they actually took demographic health survey data on stunting and laid that up against geospatial data on a number of different variables to see where there were correlations between the geospatial data and the stunting data. Then they were able to actually use geospatial data to predict stunting in areas where they didn't have the survey data. So essentially they were able to use the big data to increase the resolution of the traditional data. Um, and in the result, um, or as a result, they were able to really expand the understanding of stunting by geography to understand gender differences, and then ultimately hopefully use that to inform the response. And while the CRBS example and this, these are just a couple of examples of some really thoughtful and interesting work being done. Um, I'm sure many of you have in your work come across other examples as well, and I hope we have the opportunity to hear more. Um, like this as, as the session continues. Next slide, please. So we'll wrap up here, but um, on behalf of Emily and myself, we really appreciate your time and I'm so looking forward to the discussion later in the session. Thank you. Thank you, Emily and Neeraja for laying the foundation for our seminar series. Um, I am familiar with a lot of the statistics that you presented, but it, it always reinvigorates me when I when I see them again, um, reinvigorates my passion for doing this work. So thank you. Um, questions for Emily and Niraja will be taken at the end after our uh, lived experience panel discussion. But now I'd like to introduce Srilatha Batliwala, our panel moderator. Srilatha is a feminist activist scholar and trainer. She is senior advisor of knowledge building at CREA, creating resources for empowerment in action, the senior associate for gender at work and an honorable professor of practice at SOAS, University of London. Srilatha's career spans over 40 years in grassroots activism, policy advocacy, teaching, research, grant making, building women's movements, and capacity building of young women activists around the world. She was a civil society research fellow at the Hauser Center for Nonprofit Organizations at Harvard University, and she has a master's in social work from the Tata Institute of Social Sciences. Srilatha, welcome. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, it's an honor to be here and to be moderating this panel. And I believe it is now my pleasant duty to introduce our panelists for today. And um, I'm about to do that. Um, we'll start with uh, Hua, whose formal name is Nachali Bunya Pisongvarn. I'm going to do the intros rather quickly so that we can save more time for the, for the you know, uh, panel discussion and for the open forum um, at the end. Uh, so Hua is a transgender activist and transgender woman from Thailand. She is currently project manager of the intersex and trans movement building project at the Astria Lesbian Foundation for Justice, and also serves as vice president of the Thai Foundation Board at the Asia Pacific Transgender Network and is project manager of the Trans 
Health Access Thailand project. Hua has worked extensively with local nonprofits and organizations supporting women, LGBT, and other marginalized communities in Thailand, as well as a number of international organizations and networks. So welcome Hua and thank you for joining us. Next is Andrea Gonzalez Pacheco. Andrea is an expert in the design of projects focused on discrimination and gender inequality. Andrea has an MA in project design, gender equality, domestic violence, and social education. She is co-founder of Nuestro Flow, a company that designs social impact projects to promote cultural diversity and gender equality in her home country of Colombia. She is also the CEO of El Negro Esta de Moda, one of Nuestro Flow's projects that fights racial discrimination and connects Mestizo people with Afro-Colombians, especially in and around Bogota. She is a passionate advocate on social issues affecting women in Colombia and has won recognition for her leadership and her leadership fellowships. Welcome, Andrea, and thank you for joining us. And finally, we have Leanne, whose last name I've been practicing saying correctly, Leanne van der Murfa. Leanne is a self-identified transgender woman and intersectional feminist. She holds an MPH in public health from the University of South Africa. She is founder and director of SHE, the Social Health and Empowerment Feminist Collective of Transgender Women of Africa, a pioneering organization working to bring the political voice of transgender women into research, praxis, and advocacy. Leanne has worked extensively on research projects focused on transgender people in South Africa and has conceptualized innovative projects such as the African Transformative Feminist Leadership Institute. She's published widely and has extensive research experience at both the national and international levels. So welcome, Leanne. And now let's begin our panel discussion uh, with the first question. I'm going to pose the question and then call on each of you by name to respond. Uh, and each of you will have three minutes and I'm going to be a very strict chair and have a timer on. So the first question is, what are the key barriers to equity and inclusion faced by your community or the communities that you prioritize and work with? And what role do you think data has played in aggravating these challenges? So let me put that to you first, Andrea. Wow, well, thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, I just wanna say that I'm, that is an honor for me to be here and to share with you this information. Um, to answer the question, well, I'm gonna to start to tell you that, um, as you say before, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Nuestro Flow. That is a social company uh, where we work uh, to promote cultural diversity and gender equality. Um, we fight discrimination, racial and, dis and gender discrimination. And with this in mind, the marginalized uh, communities who we work with are the different ethnic groups as uh, Afro-Colombians, indigenous, uh, gypsy communities, and in another hand, migrants. That is a, a cultural diversity too. And inside of these groups, the women and girls and the more marginalized communities. So with this uh, group that we are working with, um, we are facing many barriers or they are facing many, many barriers. And, but but uh, I'm, I'm gonna tell you a couple that we have identified with our experience and it's in Colombia and probably, I, I can't say that maybe in all Latin America, the key barriers uh, to equity and inclusion that they face are um, in one hand, or first of all, 
the government neglect neglect and this um yeah ne ne neglect with these communities and it can happen because two they, they have two reasons one because of the ethnic groups are uh, our places in the privileged towns full of natural resources and these situations becoming an att attractive territories for the conflict art you know that colombia have suffered a conflict arm from long time ago so uh this is so important to to say and to highlight and um in another when in this this situation that happened um with these communities in our, our privileges uh, territories but also because they are in um some places very far away from the uh, center of the important cities there are remote territories where the government is not going, where nobody can not go um, because they don't want to or because the condition and so special. So they are very far away from the principal cities. And the other key barrier is the discrimination, the negative stereotypes and the unconscious bias that the mestizo people or the general people have over these ethnic groups and they suffer about this all the time they have the uh, this, uh, uh, structural discrimination but also the discrimination for the other people from me to for the mestizo people that's how nuestro flow start to work in the data here in this two Andrea, your time is almost up your time okay. is almost up so if you say at, you. Least, yes. uh, at least a sentence about the data the data dimension yes. the data is that we needed that data we we need to know uh how many indigenous people we are we have how many afro colombians we have and we don't have that data so we can know without that data we can know help them we can know we can to know what are the necessities so we have many things to do about the data issue thank okay. you okay <laughs> thank you so much uh leanne would you weigh in on this question about the nature of the uh, exclusions and inequities and the role data plays as far as uh, trans women and the trans community is concerned in South Africa. My apologies, thank you for the question. I was on mute. Um, thank you colleagues, I'm so, I'm so happy to be here. It's a huge honor for me to be here, I think. Insofar as the data barriers concerned, I think one of the, the most potent and violent ripple effects is that the invisibility of transgender people in data is often used against us as a community when it comes to the allocation of resources, when it comes to health planning, when it comes to just and equal uh, resource distribution to provide health services to the transgender community because so often, um, you know, if you go especially government facilities um, for healthcare services, it only provides for uh, mainstream identities. And when I say mainstream identities, I mean cisgender, heterosexual ideas of identity and ideas of bodies. And so queer bodies do not show up in the data. And I think that for me is one of the, the single biggest um, barriers uh, when it comes to healthcare, because that the effect of it is that it's poorly planned, it's poorly budgeted for, plans are poorly executed. And normally when services are designed, they are designed in a way that is not respectful of our gender identity, not respectful of our health needs as a gender diverse community. Thank you so much. That was uh, very clear and uh, to the point. Uh, Hua, how would you respond to this question? Where Thank are the so blind spots? Thank you so much um, for inviting me here today. I Actually, I think it suits me really well uh, to share experiences as a transgender person and also working with trans people in Thailand. First of all, what I want to say is that Thailand is not a heaven 
for trans people, even though there is a high visibility of trans population in Thailand, but we never know how many of them. We never know. We just know that it's high visibility. Why I say that? Because there is no legal gender recognition in Thailand or gender healthcare coverage for trans health in Thailand that there are none of it. Employment is still a barrier, a big barrier for many trans people in Thailand. I have always heard about it from my parents um, and from the other that, you know, if you are trans, you cannot find a job, you know, you will have a hard time finding a job. Um, but having, but there is no one tell me how many people, right, cannot find a job due to being a transgender person until the World Bank Thailand in 2017 conducted our last scale survey of 3,500 respondents who are from cisgender male and female and also LGBT community. And the survey found that 77% of transgender respondents said that job application were refilled because they were transgender. So it's the high, big high number. That, that is the one example from the research. It is very important to know that gender affirming health services are primary health care for trans people. However, many trans people have to pay for those services out of their own pocket and are forced to shoot low quality services because of the cost of the services are very expensive. So not everybody can afford to the gender affirming health care in Thailand. And from the data I have, Gender affirming health services are not available to our public health care system in Asia and the Pacific, except in Hong Kong, China, and some, some state of India. And that is the data from 2015. That might be a slightly changed uh, since we are in 2022. When advocating for trans health care coverage for trans people with the government, especially with the Na National Health Security Office, they often ask how many trans people do we talk about? I actually have no, I have no exact answer for this question, nor other would have known you know, how many people that we have. Then I would ask them back, how can we do better to obtain this important data? I believe that the most important question moving forward is how can the community and the government collaborate to get this issue resolved? And Absolutely. I will stop. Yeah. You were perfect in terms of time. Thank you so much. Well, I think it's pretty clear from what, um, sorry, from what all three of you have said that there is a, a very serious role that uh, data blindness is playing in, in aggravating the uh, exclusions and uh, injustices and violence, as Liam pointed out, faced by some of the most uh, marginalized communities that the three of you have been working with. So let me move on to the second question. Um, on a more positive note, can you share with us one major accomplishment or even just a step forward in this respect that has empowered your community? in any sense, any step forward or major accomplishment uh, that has made a positive difference that you'd like to share. And tell us how did it happen and who was involved? Um, let me start with you, Hua. All right, thank you so much for this question. I think in Thailand, we have had a trans exclude. Actually, we have had a trans exclusive HIV program since 2004. Um, we are probably one of the earliest uh, country that have specific transgender HIV program um, in the, you know, in Asia. We have done a lot of work and research to get information about trans people in relation to HIV and STI prevention, care and support. In addition to this information, Thailand Ministry of Interior recorded gender identity data from trans women who are 21 years old and participate in the mandatory military, military conscription since 2016. And found roughly, roughly 
um, about one uh, percent of trans women form a total of twenty one years old Thai men who participate in this mandatory military conscription each year, and we have, and if we use this figure, we have seventy million Thai people population now. I would say if we use this figure, we might have. 700,000 trans women of all age, which might be under estimation due to a high visibility of trans people in Thailand. You know, they are in every corner. When, if you, you will see them when you come, if you know that they are trans women. Um, I also would like to point out that because there was a, we, you know, there was a research from many years ago that showed the youngest trans women who start her transition can be as young as 13 years old. And, and, and that's why this probably correspondent to a high visibility of trans people in Thailand. And to find out the exact number of trans people in Thailand is most needed. The data from the HIV program can be very useful to the program design, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation. But it's not, not cover the trans men population at all. Healthcare research for trans people are predominantly focused on trans women. Trans men are invisible in healthcare advocacy and services, not only in Thailand but in many countries, oh, wow. Asia yeah. and the Pacific. And that's what I want to mention for now. And, and, and I will continue to answer my question in the, in, uh, for the next question. Thank you. OK, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, over to you, Leanne. Something good that's happened, some positive change. I think the example, I think there's, there are many good examples that had come out of South Africa. I want to um, begin with the example of how transgender women have managed to, to augment the research discourse. Because let's face it, there will always be Global North researchers coming into our country with very, naive ways about data collection and very naive ways of thinking about research problems in the global south, they'll always be there. It doesn't matter what we do, that there's that colonial relationship. I do think, however, that we have the potential of changing the trajectory. So not just about whether or not we get counted, but how we are counted that is incredibly important to me. And I'll make one very good example is that in the past, so, so previously I spoke about how the lack of data leads to insufficient planning and resource allocation for transgender people. And one of the questions that the government used to ask us is, how do we know that we have a problem in relation to HIV yeah. among transgender women? And I kept saying to them is that because we as trans women are providing the palliative care to our sisters who are busy dying from HIV infection. We are the self-made social workers who have to shift between the economy, the social climate, giving care to somebody. And that's how we know these stories. And those are very powerful things when we bring them into research because those, those stories, those experiences characterize how we collect the data. For me, it's not only a matter of whether or not we do get counted, but a matter of how do we get counted and whether that's meaningful. To make one concrete example, when we did our first uh, uh, biobehavioral survey for transgender women in South Africa, our research body wrote to us and said, oh, we want to do this research. We said to them that if there's not a transgender woman who's included as one of the principal investigators, then we have nothing to talk about. And, you know, augmenting that, the trajectory of the research, how we show up to data is something that I continuously, uh, you know, school young transgender women in 
because it's not just about showing up in the data, but how do we make that meaningful? If we are gonna get traumatized by research questions, we should make that count and count in our favor. Absolutely, absolutely, bravo. Andrea, tell us some of your relative success stories. So I'm not sure we can call any of these absolute successes, but steps forward, certainly. Yeah, thank you. And thanks, Huai and Leia, to share that beautiful examples. And so is for it. And well, I'm going to tell you about um, the last uh, year that we developed our first project in collaboration with one organization in Montreal, Canada, called Seed Concordia. This relation is because I uh, founded Nuestro Flow with my sister, Mabel Gonzalez, as she is living there in Canada. And many times we were asked, uh, we were talking about the differences from the situations um, that, that face the women in Canada and in Colombia. And we think that is very different, but uh, very deeply is not that, that different. So we take the risk to create this project that we call it Women Sol Solidarity Entrepreneurship in Colombia and Quebec. And we created with the objective to provide women entrepreneurs from diverse groups as an indigenous Afro migrant from rural sector from Quebec and Colombia, a program in order to support the expansion of their business endeavors and counterbalance the impact uh, related to gender and cultural discrimination exacerbated by the isolation related with the COVID-19 sanitary measures. We're trying to compare and to have uh, many points in common with these women. So we have 23rd uh, participants from both countries in the most empowered situation was that we create a network between them. With, between them. Uh, we don't know how because the language was the first barrier that we face, uh, but we still create um, a common language. We create a networking when they can um, share their experience for both countries. They share the similar situations uh, from discrimination in Canada and in Colombia. They share the similar um, good practices that they, they have and they, they are uh, putting in common in, in both countries. They share the similar um, yeah, uh, problems that they face all the time. And I don't know, but, but you think that maybe you as a woman, you, you can share with me that when we share our problems, we don't feel alone. We know that we have somebody else and this is powerful. We need to create these networks and not only in Colombia, we need to create it in a lot, all around the world. And that will happen with this project. Um, in, in, the, in the project, we have another um, part that was a, a very good research about these situations. We put it in an inform, in an investigation with two um, university, uh, Concordia University from, from Canada and the uh, Universidad Monserrate from Colombia. And I'm gonna share with you in the chat uh, the research. So you can see we have the data and it's the first time that we have it. So that was a, a really empowered project. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that. So let's go a little deeper. Um, because our third question, it's not so much a question, but a request uh, that you share a story as ground level as possible, uh, where, and you know, I think Andrea, you have partly done that already, but as ground level as possible, where some kind of innovation and innovative strategy has helped your community to achieve greater visibility and you know greater voice and uh, in inclusion um, because we've been talking about the invisibility the negligence andrea your word uh, but where you feel that these excluded communities um, asserted their presence and made themselves visible in some way um, let's start with you leanne can you share with us a story like that 
Thank you. Thank you so much. One of the ways that I am a firm believer that, um, that one should show up. And so one of the ways that I've really pushed advocacy around data in South Africa has been to show up. Two concrete examples, our provincial AIDS council and our national AIDS council. I started this work at a time when transgender women were lumped under MSM. Mm -hmm. And so the gentle nudge was, you know, if you're gonna be having sex in this particular way, your issues might as well be covered there without fully giving recognition that it's a violation of our, of our gender identity. And we've also come to know that the very social construct of gender, as we have seen in cisgender women, is also very deleterious when it comes to transgender women and HIV infection. And so one of the things is that we, I constantly showed up in those spaces and I reiterated my message. And if I needed to do that a hundred times, then I would happily do that. But because of that advocacy, we now have the Global Fund investment that is focused on addressing HIV as well as not just the biomedical component, but also the social and structural determinants um, of HIV. And this is a history that I've recently documented in a commentary in The Lancet, in which I talk about my journey in advocating for equitable resources and appropriate data collection for HIV among transgender women in South Africa. This was 10 years ago when we had no data. We had no program. Mm -hmm. And so one of the ways in which we were able to really push that forward is to show up because the, one of the programs that were designed, the previous iteration of the program was that it focused very strictly on, um, it's focused only on the biomedical uh, aspects. But, you know, I constantly had to go into those rooms and talk about, you know, HIV doesn't happen in a vacuum. If we don't address HIV in its fullest context, if we don't understand the social and structural uh, context of HIV infection, then you know all our efforts are futile. And so sometimes those are really important things to say to um, to policymakers. I have had to learn to control my, my temper over the years because when you know when when you've seen the effect of this when you've been the person who have given palliative care services to transgender women who are dying from HIV infection, you feel like there's no time to, to have pleasantries. You know, it's time for change and it's time for change now. And so my strategy has really been to show up and speak up in as many places that I possibly can. Thank you. And I think your sense of anger is, is very, Justified. Uh -uh. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hua, share with us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, ground, that is ground not... level story. Okay. I will try my best to answer that question. I don't know if I can answer the, <laughs> to give you exact answer that you want, but there's an article titled Ensuring that LGBTQI plus people count collecting data on sexual orientation, gender identity, and intersex status is the paper. State that data are fundamentally political decision about which data are corrected and which are ignored, both reflect and shape policy and program priorities. And I, I totally agree with them. I just want to give you an example. Gender affirming healthcare is primary healthcare for trans people, and it is the most basic services that affect transgender well being and our life. And many trans people cannot access to gender affirming healthcare due to many reasons, such as a high cost of these services. You know, not, not, not many people can afford to it. The services are not available because these services are where in the big city, not you know everywhere. Absolutely. And not, ma not many healthcare providers are knowledgeable about trans health and trans issues. 
and so on. But uh, what I see the Shen from HIV program is that they incorporate uh, a little bit of gender affirming healthcare into their program to draw attention for trans people to access to HIV program. So you cannot run HIV program for trans people without gender affirming component. That's what I want to say because, because, because gender affirming is very important. And at least you, 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 you need to know what kind of hormone they use. You, you need to have that information to give them the, you know, the basic, basic information that they need for their own health. And I believe that gender identity data, if, you, if, if we can improve, will not only help address the issue, but also the data will echo the experience of trans people in the healthcare system and other social issues. The data will also improve the healthcare policy to be inclusive of all trans people, not only count them in a certain public healthcare system or just the HIV program, right? But we need all kind of this data to improve healthcare system for trans people and that includes gender affirming healthcare. Um, time is almost up. Last time point. Is almost up. The last point, I just want to share the experience that I have recently, I got COVID and the hospital want to put me in to share the room with a cisgender male. Sorry? And that to share a room with a cisgender male and I reject, I say, no, I cannot sleep with other men in the room. I want to have my own room because I'm a transgender woman. That's what I told them but they cannot do anything about it. I think if Thailand has a data or gender data, they should do better. They should know that I am exist and I should be included in the healthcare policy and the healthcare policy should sensitize to my gender identity and sexual orientation. And that's just that's what I want to say. And then, Thank you so much for this well, question. I think that's a very powerful ground level story, your own experience. Yeah, Andrea. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you have realized that um, we have some common expression as the black market, the black list, the black sheep, work as a black to live as a white in some some others that we use um, with the word black in a negative way and we don't realize that we are talking about the black culture well uh, that happened with us in 2017 when we launched the first program from women entrepreneurs call it the black list of colombian women entrepreneurship and we select 10 black women um, from all around Colombia. And the innovation was that with the program, we start to change the language. We start to change the way, the way we talk because how we talk, we think and we act. And that's the, the way that we, that the discriminations start. So we start to, to, to have a hard conversation about discrimination and about the unconscious bias that uh, we have over the black communities. And uh, principle, we start to change the language and to start to have this hard conversation with, with us, with the people that is not from the black communities, because we have that responsibility about the discrimination that they suffer. So this was the innovation part that we, we take. Uh, I know that maybe we can uh, think that to change the language is not that important, but the small changes start everything. The small changes start to have more power about the communities, uh, black communities, uh, people. We start to change and to realize why I think uh, about the negative way from other cultures. So since that moment in Nuestro Flow, our mission is to create new narrative to change the way we live. And I think that this is an invitation for all of you uh, trying to change the narrative that we are saying all the time. 
we need to change the narrative how the women's uh, we see the women's around we are no more competitive we are a, a collaborative we are partners we need to change our language about the indigenous people too about the afro-colombians about the transgenders about many many uh, groups that um, start with uh, small changes but we can create a big change if we start with this and this is my story i think that was very powerful was very disruptive yeah. at the beginning but uh now we are trying the, to create the black market a place where we can sell a products from the black communities and trying to forget that it's an illegal place as we yeah. use the, the that uh, phrase so that's it this is an invitation <laughs> Perfect. A beautiful story and language is a very powerful tool for shifting mindsets as well as we know. Yeah. Thank you so much, Andrea. Okay, so um, the floor is open now. And I think uh, our colleague Deb Levine has already collected some questions. So Deb, will you post? I have it. Oh. Thank okay. you very much to you, Srilatha, Pua, Leanne, and Andrea. Uh, really interesting stories that you share, and we really appreciate it. Uh, now we want to welcome back Miraja and Emily to answer selected audience questions uh, for all the speakers. Thank you, Miraja. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, So um, I've been asked to read out the question to Emily and Nirja. Here it goes. Um, getting cause of death data from verbal autopsies in communities is highly technical and difficult to collect. Medical certification of cause of death is also not existing in many countries. So what would be the best way to collect cause of death data for one third deaths globally. You can see the, the question in, in the chat pane as well. Hmm. Um, maybe I'll start and then Emily, please feel free to, to jump in. Um, gosh, that's a really hard question and I wish I had a great answer for how we could fill this massive gap. Um, but I think we need to think of this as sort of two parts. I think the first part is going back to that more system investment question. I think, you know, the fundamental reason we don't have data on one third of deaths is because we haven't been investing sufficiently in data systems. Um, and unless those systems and that infrastructure is in place, there's no way to capture this. And so, um, you know, we've done some work and globally, it's something like, you know, we're missing $450 million a year in, in data systems. And so until we start filling that gap in the long term, we won't be able to solve this. Um, in the short term, I think it's a, maybe a little bit of a different answer in particular contexts. I think there may be some places, yes, verbal autopsies are a, a short term fill, they're not quite as good and they are still resource intensive. So that can be a solution in some place, but I think this is where I, you know, I would really look to, to communities and see how different contexts are finding different ways to fill this. So maybe that's a heavier reliance on community health workers where those are available. Maybe that's relying on CSOs and other organizations where those are available. But I think it's sort of a, a mixed answer with a lot of different people involved. Emily? I, I don't have much to add though. I would just say, I, I know this isn't the context in which Leanne gave the example and, and kind of made this point, but I think it's incredibly important around, it's the piece around involving, I, yes, it's technical, but also um, I think that involving people in the community on um, understanding cause of death and on the kind of connection that has to, to people's lives and to who is still there and the implications that has for planning and progress really can't be understated. And I think that those linkages um, between civil society, you know, kind of, if they talk about it as citizen generated data sometimes in different communities, this understanding of data, I totally agree who are around, uh, we say this a lot too, 
data as a political force, not just some technical conversation. All of those inter interlinkages are incredibly important and also incredibly weak. Um, and that is because of underinvestment in the system. And it is because of a need, I think, having kind of worked in this for a while, of all of us needing to expand our understanding of what it means, like why you want to have good data and what you want to use it for, right? We have to expand our view um, beyond the technical into the political um, and into being very disciplined about making those connections, which is bigger than cause of death, but I, I think it's still relevant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Shall we move on to another question? Maybe the participants are thinking because there's been a lot to take in today. Huh? Srilatha, we have some questions in the Q&A section. Um, maybe I could just read one briefly. Yeah, sure. Um, um, oh, I think Deb, I'm sorry. I think Deb has posted one. Go ahead. I think she's, uh, she's keeping track of the Q&A box. Um, the question is, how do we advocate for gender data collection and use in countries where governments and stakeholders are resistant or lack interest. So both in contexts where, you know, they don't want to even, you know, recognize that some of these communities exist, much less give them the importance of being counted. And then in contexts where there's just apathy or indifference how how what kind of advocacy strategies Hua, would you like to feel that yes i think how yeah i think how how is the question right so i think uh, i try to think of the you know the ask I, I believe there are many ways to answer this question, but one of the, because they come from the community, I think building the capacity for the community and also provide space for them to raise their voice or echo their own experience, um, uh, the experience um, that, like the experience that they have um, or the issue that they are facing are very important because and because if this never been less, I believe um, the government might have, might not really know, but, 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 but in the democracy country, right? Um, like I, I, I think the government should, should listen to that people, but it's not always true, right? Even though, you know, my country, um, that's why we never had gender data uh, or anything like that um, in, um, in Thailand, uh, not yet, even though there, there are many discussions about it. Um, but I think because I, I, I want to give an example of HIV program though, because HIV program, um, HIV program in Thailand is one of the progressive uh, program and um, they provide a lot of space for people from the community to, you know, to share experiences, I think the more you listen to their experiences, the more you think about how to improve um, program that fit the need of the community. So I, 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 I think we need a space for community member to, to, to share their experience and to share what they are facing. Yeah. 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 Leanne, I think there's a request that you respond to this one context of indifference or actual resistance to collecting certain types of data about certain communities. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Sri Lanka. Thank you, Hua, for the preceding uh, uh, um, response. And I do agree fully with you that when we collect data on certain communities, it's very important that we make sure those communities are up front and center in driving the advocacy and in collecting the data, in deciding how decisions are made about that data, and most importantly, about finding innovative ways of sharing that data. Um, I want to stress that um, I have been the subject of a lot of master's research for US-based students, a lot of doctoral students. Once that data collector was out of my sight, I never saw that data again, apart from a thesis. What does that mean though for me on the ground in Africa? How is that useful for me? How does it shift things for me? And if I go with a thesis to my policymakers and say, Sri Lata collected this data on my experience and my life as a transgender woman, I don't think, I don't think they, you know, they, they're going to throw out the welcome net at me, right? And so when we develop our research questions, when we think about our work plan for research questions, let us think about um, the stakeholders that we want to disseminate the data to our governments, policy bodies, um, you know, uh, advocacy organizations, because we cannot fight this fight alone. We must recognize that it is intersectional. And in that intersection, there already exists one strategy for um, aligning ourselves in an advocacy context to, um, to women who are disabled, looking at cross sets of data, how can both of our communities benefit from the advocacy that comes forth out of, out of our data? And I found that one of the ways in which resistant stakeholders tend to listen, one of the ways in holding them accountable, is also aligning ourselves to bigger movements, like the transgender movement in South Africa has aligned itself to the women's movement, to the feminist movement, to the people living with HIV movement. And that has been a very powerful way of ensuring that even if government won't listen to transgender people, it will definitely, it might listen to other movements. And so it's important to find a voice there. Yeah, I can't resist sharing an example of my own here, uh, just to add to this repertoire of strategies, and that is uh, generating your own data as kind of challenge data. Uh, we did this uh, many, many years ago when we were working with pavement dwellers in Bombay, and exactly that kind of attitude of, we don't care, and you know, why the hell should we have a policy towards them? And we actually did a census because there were numbers, mad numbers being floated in the media. Oh, there are millions of them. Oh, there are just a few thousand. Why should we have a policy? So we actually did a census and we challenged the government to disprove our data. And so for the first time, they actually conducted a, a, a sort of counter census of pavement dwellers, found our data was very accurate. And then that led to a whole dialogue around rehousing and shelter. Anyway, sorry, stepped out, took off my moderator hat there for a minute. So um, the next question, and I'd like to invite um, uh, Emily and Nietzsche to respond to this first. How do you suggest comparing data across countries and cultural contexts when there's so much inconsistency in data quality and completeness. You all are not pulling punches. Um, <laughs> whoever <laughs> asked the question, whoever asked. You know, <laughs> I'm joking. I'm I'm yeah. joking. No, I mean, I, I think again, it's sort of like the first question we had. You know, this is the this is the the challenge, right? I mean, and and actually, what you're seeing, I think, are the challenges at every level, right? So on the one hand, you know, we're we're lacking data um, on you know at a global level, right? In every country, in every region, and I want to just kind of underline the point that it's 
in every region, right? We've, we've, we, you know, this is not, um, this is equally a global North challenge. Um, and I think that there needs to be more attention. Um, not, I wouldn't say there needs to be more attention on the global North, but I just want to say that it's a shared challenge and a shared problem. Um, and no one's doing well <laughs> on gender data <clears throat> overall. And so, um, but on the, on the other end, right? There is also this challenge around, you know, um, the, you know, at at country and at community levels, we also don't have, you know, any of the data or enough of the data that we need to to really be having a practical effect on, on people's lives in the way that we would like to see. And so, I think on the comparability piece, you know, it really does come back to. Um, there needs to be more attention, more accountability, and more funding, um, and more imp importance attached to this. Because in, unless we kind of just keep that pressure on, unless, like Leanne was just saying, you know, um, and I just have to say, I'm breathless with admiration over this panel. I want to just get in a room with everyone and spend days talking. Um, it's so inspiring. But unless I think we we keep that spotlight, right, and keep that attention and really try to drive um, investment in this, we, it, we can't get to comparability um, because if the data is not existing, you know, that's going to be, you know, an ongoing challenge. I think we can do the best we can, right? We've certainly done, you know, we, you know from, from our vantage point, right, and with some of our, our partners um, trying to show, you know, that availability across regions and across countries. Um, but I think we can only do what we can, um, and we have to keep mobilizing investment and attention um, at global levels, at regional levels, at country levels, in order to really get us where we need to go. Yeah. Nirja, anything you want to add to that? No, I mean, and I just want to echo, though, Emily's admiration for this panel. I, truly, every single woman on here is just such an inspiration and completely agree. Would love to love to yeah. spend more time with yeah. all of you. I think in terms of this question, though, I think something that the panelists have also brought out, which we need to flag, is that even the way to, to come to comparability requires certain kind of standardization of not just the data, but the data collection methodology. And that's quite problematic. You know, if people begin to experience the collection of data as traumatizing and so on, you know, so even the process of arriving at standardized methodologies is is quite complex and and tricky so and the way that, that and and the way sorry but just to say because you're right you're so right but also the way that those methodologies are formed right not not participatory you know we've seen this exactly. i know we're talking about health but yeah. we've seen this in economics up in a room somewhere yes yes right. and it's yeah. it's not at all and it's about the wording of the question and the order of questions in a survey and all of those things and that Absolutely. has to be developed in a different way in order to get where we want to go completely agree okay so now i'm getting desperate messages to shut up and wind up and hand back to Michelle, which I gladly do. Thank you all so very much for this fabulous, fabulous panel discussion. Thank you all. Thank back you to so you, Michelle. Much. Thank you very much. And thank you to the audience for such thoughtful questions. I know some of them were, were a bit challenging for our panelists, but that's great. Uh, we love that sort of dialogue. So we hope today's seminar has started you thinking about integrating gender equity into your work in new and insightful ways. We are asking that Data for Health partners spend the next few minutes taking a brief knowledge check on the materials presented today. Uh, this will qualify you for a gender equity certificate at the end of the series. And the knowledge check is offered in French, Portuguese, Spanish, and English. Um, you can scan the QR code in the slides uh, or the, the link in the chat. This Zoom webinar will stay open for the next 10 minutes in case you have any problems accessing the knowledge check. Uh, but thank you again to all of our panelists, to our audience. We hope to see you next Wednesday, 23rd of February at 9 a.m. Eastern time for the next seminar in this series titled Key Ingredients in Driving Gender Equity in Health Data. Thank you all very much. We really appreciate the participation.